just realized I was muted there. Uh, good evening to everyone again, and uh, good morning to you if you're joining us from across the planet Earth. Um, is that a flat Earth or is that a spherical Earth? That's what we're going to find out tonight and talk about. Uh, so welcome again to uh, Toronto Apologetics. My name is Tony Costa. I will be your host uh, tonight. And uh, as you know, Toronto Apologetics is committed to the defense of the uh, Christian faith. It's uh, committed to dealing with controversial issues that um, assail uh, the historic uh, Christian faith. And we uh, bring on uh, special guests who are, are uh, specialists in various fields. Uh, we deal with uh, topics ranging from theology to politics, uh, to issues concerning ethics and, and morality and, and philosophy and so forth. And so uh, if you haven't done so already, we encourage you to uh, to uh, subscribe to Toronto Apologetics. It's absolutely free. Uh, and we also encourage you to like the video. Uh, we want to get as many as many hits as possible. We want to get people to, to watch this video. Uh, and so uh, we are here. We are here to, uh, as 1 Peter 3.15 says, to sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts and always be ready uh, to give an answer, to give an apologia, a reason, an account, a defense uh, for the hope that you have in you, uh, but to do this with reverence and with humility. And so tonight, folks, we are going to be addressing the subject of the flat earth or the flat earth theory. And uh, as of late, there has been uh, a lot of voices coming out uh, and arguing that uh, the earth is actually flat. Um, many of them, they're not necessarily religious. There are atheist flat earthers. There are Muslim flat earthers. And there are Christian flat earthers. Uh, and some of them uh, uh, hail from uh, the creationist uh, camp, although not all creationists uh, are flat earthers. Um, and so uh, we want to discuss this. Uh, a lot of folks think that the Bible actually teaches a flat earth. Uh, and that'll base that on on various passages in Scripture. But tonight, uh, I thought that I would bring on a um, a dear brother in Christ, uh, uh, a fellow apologist, a colleague that I uh, had the pleasure of of meeting uh, in, in person, uh, at least virtually in person, uh, yesterday. Uh, last night, I was uh, we were both on uh, on uh, Revealed Apologetics with Eli Ayala. And uh, we were on with uh, several other apologists uh, like Matt Slick and um, and Braxton Hunter and others. Uh, so if you haven't done so already, you could check out Revealed Apologetics and watch that video. So I'm greatly honored to uh, have on uh, my dear brother in Christ, uh, Michael Jones from Inspired Philosophy. Michael, it's good to see you, brother. It's been, what is it? It's been less than 24 hours since I last saw you. But, <laughs> yes, uh, ages. You've aged since then, yeah. <laughs> So it's good to have you on, uh, Michael. If you can just tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe a little bit about your uh, channel, uh, Inspired Philosophy, um, mm -hmm. Inspiring Philosophy, is it? Or is it Inspired Philosophy? Inspiring Philosophy. Inspiring. Inspiring yeah. Philosophy. And folks, all that information is in the description box, all the links to uh, Michael's uh, YouTube channel, his Facebook, Twitter, everything else. It's all available there. Uh, so Michael, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about... Uh, what your ministry, your channel, Inspiring Philosophy is about. Yeah, so my name is Michael. Uh, I have a master's in philosophy from the University of Arizona, uh, and I run Inspiring Philosophy. I do a lot of Christian apologetic videos, defending the Bible, defending the Christian worldview. Uh, you rarely see my face on my channel unless it's in a short video. Most of my long videos are just graphic animated style videos. Yeah, and and actually, I would, I would recommend you guys check out uh, uh, Michael's uh, TikTok videos are quite interesting. They're very short videos, but they're they're to the point. And and uh, and if you've been hearing rumors, I think uh, one of our uh, one of our uh, com our uh, guests here uh, says, "I think your great Michael, please don't become an alcoholic." Uh, and that, of course, is based on some charges that uh, a pastor in the Fundamentalist Baptist Church has brought against you. Uh, yeah. So 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 of course I love you hear it. The Anytime you drink alcohol, anyone who doesn't drink immediately accuses you of being an alcoholic. Doesn't matter yeah. how much, how little. You're oh, you yeah. must be an alcoholic. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I'm sure, I'm sure you're you're the butt of a lot of criticism as well in other areas too. Uh, but I really appreciate your work. Um, uh, while Michael and I have our differences, uh, I'm I'm a I'm a, a reformed, I'm presuppositionalist. Um, Michael is uh, an evidentialist apologist, classical apologetics. Am I correct, uh, Michael? Classical mm -hmm. apologetics, yeah. Classical. Uh, 
but but at the end of the day, we're we're brothers in Christ. We may have some of our some differences there, but we are here to serve the Lord and to defend the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Uh, and so, Michael, we want to talk a little bit about this this flat Earth. We've been hearing a lot of this stuff coming out uh, from various camps, uh, not just in the Christian camp, but as you know, there's Muslim uh, flat earthers and so forth. Um, can you maybe tell us a little bit about this the, this ideology, the flat earth ideology? When did it start? Uh, why, is the, why is this really big news right now? Does it have something to do with the pandemic and the fact that people were isolated for two years? Well, I, I saw it before that. There was a documentary on Netflix that came out prior to that called like Behind the Curve, where they explored the Flat Earth movement and, and the group and all of their backstories and how they got involved with it. So it's really sort of new. It's like a modern movement. It's not like it's been around for, you know, 2000 years. I mean, belief in the Flat Earth died out, you know, millennia ago, but now it's coming back because in my view, it, it's people want to feel unique. Everybody wants to be Neo in the Matrix and feel like they're special. They know the truth and everyone else is blind to it. So the mainstream groups must be lying somehow. And me and my undercover knit group people, we are the ones who really know the truth and we're fighting the powers. I think that's obviously, honestly, I think that's where it comes from. I don't think there's any evidence in science to show the earth is flat. I, I mean, I, anytime someone says the earth is flat, I just hold up a picture from a satellite that was taken from space. And I go, look here. And if they keep talking, I throw it over their head. Right. Right. And, and, and what do you do in cases, uh, Michael, I'm sure you've heard uh, where people say, well, how do you know NASA didn't doctor those photos? How do, how do you know <laughs> NASA didn't not only, not only that, I don't want to get off on a tangent, but as you know, Michael, there's, there's others who said, well, the whole moon landing was a setup. It was all staged in Hollywood and, and so forth. But, what would your response be to those who say, well, NASA just photoshopped those or they doctored those photos and uh, they're just they're just pulling the wool over our eyes? What, what would you say to those? OK, let's focus on the moon landing. Um, I'll give you several reasons as to why that was not fake. Uh, right. For one, um, if it was the first people who would have exposed us would have been the Russians because they wanted they did not want us to go to the moon. They would have stopped it anyway. Yet the Russians ad admitted they picked up the radio signals of of Apollo, the Apollo mission heading to the moon. Uh, also, uh, it would have been more expensive to fake the moon landing in the 1960s than actually uh, go to the moon. And what I mean by that is if you look at the technology in terms of stage lighting, they did not have like laser lights like we have today. Uh, if you look at the shadows on the moon, they're all parallel. If you go into any studio, I, I went to film school, I know this, if you set up lights, Shadows in a studio are not parallel. They'll go a diagonal because sure. they're different lights, different angles. For them to have faked the moon landing, they would have had to make a wall of white lights. The technology was not there in the 60s. If they were going to, like, also, do you guys remember the graphics of the 80s and the 90s, like the square pixelated stuff running around? That was the graphics then. You go back to the 60s and they're somehow able to fool the world with the moon landing. Like, uh, come on. This is ridiculous at this point. Mm -hmm. uh there's also they also um so they picked up the signals it'd be too expensive to make uh they actually the uh the apollo 11 mission actually met left something on the moon that reflects light so if you have a strong enough light signal you can actually hit the moon and it will reflect back to you that kind of thing and it's just utterly absurd at this point uh there there's numerous ways to show that the earth is round just by testing shadows in different areas for different parts of the day uh it's mind boggling to me. And let's also remember the fact that when Watergate broke, they couldn't even keep that a secret with just a couple people. And you're going to tell me all of NASA for the past several decades has all been quiet on this thing. It's absurd. Mm -hmm. Someone would have come forward. And of course, then they have to pause at the study that keep being killed off or something, which is just, again, you've multiplied entities beyond necessity to hold to a ridiculous theory instead of just following the evidence that the earth is round. It just doesn't make sense from a physical standpoint, from uh, an astronomical standpoint, from a cosmological standpoint, there were so many problems here. It's just utter nonsense. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I know that uh, I know about that reflector on the moon, uh, Michael, because I, I, I remember Sheldon on the Big Bang Theory. Sheldon and his group uh, actually tested it, and they saw the the reflection come back. So, yeah, that's yeah, nice, yeah. yeah. So, okay, so so the, the whole argument that NASA faked all of these photos and that they <laughs> them. Um, 
you know, one thing uh, about the photos is if they'll flat earthers will sometimes zoom in on photos and they'll be like, if you, you know, play with the saturation, you'll see there's like squares around like the moon or around like the astronauts. What they don't understand is that 1960s, 1970s photography, when you were working in the black rooms, they would do that on purpose. They would make, they'd go into the photo room and you would make squares around these things to enhance the, uh, uh, the lighting or the saturation on these specific objects. You can do that in the photo room. That's why you can see those in those old photos. But they don't think like that. They don't realize that this has been answered by people. So they just keep pushing these conspiracies that the moon was photoshopped in there or something. Yeah. And REM, uh, was it REM? Uh, can you believe they put a man on the moon? Man on the moon. You know, so that, that yeah. it's become the source of, of, of different songs and so forth. So um, so let's talk a little bit about this, this flat earth idea because – it, it is my understanding that one of the charges that has been l leveled against Christians uh, is that they're so backwards, they're so, uh, excuse the term, retarded, that uh, they believed in a flat earth. And, and, and so we have, we have this thing called the, con you've heard of the conflict thesis, I'm sure, Michael. <laughs> oh, have I? <laughs> the conflict thesis that was created um, by... Uh, two late 19th century skeptics, and I got their names here. You mentioned them in a, one of your videos, John William Draper and Andrew Dixon White. Uh, tell us a little bit about these guys uh, and their their involvement in this whole flat earth ide ideology. Yeah, so the Draper and White thesis was put forward in the 19th century because they were trying to raise money for their university, Cornell University, which was a secular university, and they didn't want money to go to religious universities at the time, like Yale or Harvard. So they put forward the conflict thesis that religion and science have always been in conflict. You should donate to a secular university because we are really the protectors of science. They made up all this nonsense about the flat earth, the idea that Christians were propagating it in the Middle Ages. Uh, and it's just utter nonsense. One of the things they sort of got their crap from was from Washington Irving, Irving's biography of Christopher Columbus. Washington Irving was a fiction writer. Earlier, he was commissioned to write a biography of Christopher Columbus. And he looked into the history and found it was quite boring. So you know what any good story needs? Conflict. So he invented this whole conflict that the church thought the earth was flat. And he knew the earth was round. He was going to prove it by sailing off. And at the time, in America, there was a lot of anti-propaganda. or There was a lot of propaganda against Catholics. So the Protestants ate it up and believed it is true. Later, Draper and White picked it up, added in, were teaching the idea that this, that this was going on. Only problem is, it's all just nonsense. There is no evidence in the Middle Ages that anyone other than maybe Cosmos thought yeah. the Earth was flat. Yeah. Or all these early writers knew the Earth was round. In fact, the church knew the Earth was round when Christopher Columbus was trying to advocate for sailing. What actually happened was is he thought the circumference of the Earth was much smaller than what it was, and he could get to India or the East Indies faster by going west. And the church, knowing the actual science, said, no, you idiot, you're going to die in a massive ocean. And he would have if he didn't run into a continent in the middle. Yeah. So it's actually the opposite. The church had the right idea, and Christopher Columbus had some backwards wrong ideas about the the actual shape of the earth. He thought it was much smaller. So that's what actually happened. But Christians were not teaching the earth was flat. This idea died out uh, long before that. Uh, it goes back to like the early Greeks who were able to uh, figure out the earth was round. They were able to even to calculate the circumference of it. Well, Later, Christian thinkers just went, okay, well, this makes sense. I mean, there's the data. Here it is. Let's move on. The things that modern flat earthers can't get for some odd reason. Right. But, so, yeah, throughout the Middle Ages, Christians knew the earth was round. And historians know this. They reject the Draper White thesis when any layman atheist on the, layman atheist on the internet says otherwise. I mean, now I'm even seeing, like, athe other atheists will attack them and say, you don't know what you're talking about, which is, I right. think, we're making progress there. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's important for our, our viewers to understand that there are atheists who are making these claims too. So it's not just a religious idea or a religious uh, promotion by Muslims and Christians. There are atheists making similar claims as well. And I like what you said, Michael, going back to the the Greeks, uh, the people like uh, people like uh, Aristotle and um, uh, Radosthenes and 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 Ptolemy, right? Uh, Claudius Ptolemaeus. Uh, in mm -hmm. the middle of the second century. These were Greek thinkers, Greek philosophers. Uh, and it's amazing how well, Plato, 300 years before Christ, uh, already knew this, that, that the earth was, was spherical. And uh, with Thomas Aquinas, uh, being an Aristotelian uh, philosopher himself, 
uh, understood this as well. So, so this idea that that the, the church bought into this flat earth theory goes completely against the, the Thomistic uh, understanding. I mean, Thomas was the, the philosopher par excellence of the Roman Catholic Church. And mm -hmm. he, he also adopted Aristotle's view of, of the, the round a spherical earth. Uh, the only thing, obviously, he rejected was the idea of this eternal universe. He, 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 he argued the five, five proofs for the existence of God, and one of them was the, the first cause. Which, which Aristotle also taught, but again, the, the Greeks had this idea of the earth being this, the universe being this eternal, it's like the, the, the machine, this functions as a machine. So, so Columbus then, the whole myth about Christopher Columbus, uh, thinking that the earth was flat is, is an absolute myth. Uh, Columbus did not believe that. And you're right, he thought in his mind that if he were to sail westward, uh, he didn't know there was a big continent there called North America. And of course, South America, and uh, maybe it was providential that he did land there, right? Uh, because um, uh, not only did he discover uh, America, so it is claimed, uh, it 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 also gave him an opportunity to take a break because the fear was he wasn't going to survive. Uh, I think most ships didn't go three days beyond uh, the, the shores because they understood that the Atlantic was a treacherous body of water. Yeah, and there were all sorts of rumors of monsters in it, and there were lost ships, of course, that it happened to. So, I mean, he was considered crazy for doing this kind of thing. Uh, yeah. uh, of course, you know, you know, America was discovered before him. I mean, the Vikings yeah. were there, and of course, of course. The, uh, you know, the Native yeah. Americans were there, of course, too. Yeah. But I mean, like, yeah. yeah, he he introduced it to Western Southern Europe area, and brought right. that, and, started, and that's when the trading exploding and you know, right that kind of thing. Right. Right. So from a, from a purely scientific point of view, these, these guys, uh, for example, uh, we talked about Draper and, and White, uh, they, they, they jumped on the Galileo, the, the whole Galileo conflict, so-called conflict with the church. And, and they basically took that, I guess, as their, their, um, their starting point, that this was an example of faith versus science. Uh, and and, and there's yeah, a ahead. lot of things they did. I mean, they they try to argue that the church prohibited dissection. They tried to argue that the church like burned like um, Giordano Bruno at the stake for practicing science, which again is a myth. That's not what happened. Mm -hmm. That Galileo and uh, Copernicus were persecuted for trying to practice science. Again, that was a myth. They just put out a lot of myths, and they were so, they had such a good marketing campaign that people still believe a lot of this crap today. Yeah. Yes, yes, and and the idea was, of course, it was religion believed in the in this uh, this geocentric flat earth, and that Galileo uh, it was the hero. Uh, science was vanquishing uh, religion, when in fact, as you know, uh, Michael, that it was really a conflict between science and science. It was the Ptolemaic geocentric model versus the Copernican uh, heliocentric model. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, I don't think it was so much religion versus science as it was. One, you know, science keeps maturing. As science, new new discoveries and new data, of course, challenges older ideas. Uh, and yet today, this myth is perpetuated in our schools. Our young children are brought to believe that that the church was this uh, this monstrous entity that was trying to persecute Galileo. And many of them don't know this, but Galileo lived a pretty good retirement. He, they paid his his pension until the day he died, and he lived quite well. Well, people have a lot of myths about it. And just to briefly cover that, Galileo was not persecuted for practicing science. Uh, he was kind of like a rock star of that day. Uh, he got a kind of a big head and he ended up in a, he was friends with the Pope for a while. And the Pope said, publish a book arguing for the Copernican model, but also list the pros and cons, be fair. And of course, Galileo wasn't going to do that. So he the book he published just sort of mocked somebody he called the fool who rejected the Copernican model and was just put some of the Pope's own arguments in this guy's mouth. So he, you know, he got himself into political trouble. Yeah. Uh, you know, he was a friend of the Pope and the Pope was able to destroy him because all of his power and popularity came from uh, that sort of hierarchy there. Galileo, so he repented of this. He was not persecuted for practicing science. He was, per he was um, put on trial for teaching that the Copernican model was a, a proven fact and not just an hypothesis. That's what the problem was. He repented of it. He, he admitted he was wrong. Uh, also, Galileo got a lot of things wrong. He, at, at, in Galileo's day, it was proven that comets were not sublunar. Now, what that means is below the moon, in the realm of the atmosphere between Earth and moon. That's, Galileo comes out and goes, nah, comets are sublunar. All of them. 
No, they're not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He also said that the tried to, he also argued against uh, Kepler for trying to say the moon controlled the tides, which he called something like magic. And it's like, no, that, that's just, we know that the moon controls the tides. And he even said something ridiculous at one point that the tide is always the same time of, at the day. Okay. That's just false too. I mean, yeah. so he wasn't like, he wasn't infallible and no. he wasn't getting all of his facts right. Um, and of course the Copernican model is not even the model we use today. It mm -hmm. was never standard science because it violates everything we know about physics. Planets cannot go around the sun in perfect circles like right. Copernicus right. posited. It goes right. in elliptical pattern, and it took the work of Kepler and Newton yep. for us to get there. And when it happened, the church accepted it just fine because the physics supported it. So people don't realize it. But at the time, the science was on the church's side, not yep. Galileo's. Yeah. Yeah. And also the, the whole issue of the uh, the planet <laughs> being perfect spheres Uh that was also, I believe, challenged by Kepler. Johannes Kepler challenged that, mm -hmm. uh, and, and and you know Aristotle had this view of this perfect this perfect machine, right? This these perfect circles and the spheres, uh, and of course Johannes Kepler, who and, and again a very pious man, a, a very devout Christian, Johannes mm -hmm. Kepler. Um, uh, I think he he referred to mathematics as, I think he he said it's the language of God, something along those lines. Uh, he was and, really the great scientist of the day. He oh, was, sure. I mean, he. I think he published more than Galileo did. And I think he, Galileo sort of like makes Kepler's shadow a little smaller, unfortunately. But Kepler was really, you know, like the, the genius, I feel like. Yeah. Galileo was a genius too, I think. But yeah. Kepler, I think, outshined him, honestly. Yeah. And I think it's also important to note that Galileo did not become an atheist. He wasn't this, oh, he's an enemy of the church. He was, he was very, to the very end, he was, he, he was committed to his faith. Uh, and, you, you know, a lot of us today, we, we keep hearing that, oh, Galileo just was a scientist and he rejected religion altogether. That's simply not the case at all. As far as I know, he never renounced his faith. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And Copernicus dedicated his book to the Pope. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So when we talk about uh, the flat the flat earth idea, I mean, so science doesn't support this. Um, we know the, the ancient Greek philosophers uh, with the limited um, tools that they had were able to determine uh, the earth was round. Um, but when we talk about the Bible, I think one of the most, key, the key texts that most people go to, uh, and I, I saw it, I've seen it in the chat as well. And folks, have you have any, if you have any questions at all, just put a Q in the comment section, a capital Q, and put your question there uh, to uh, to Michael and, and we will get to it. Um, Isaiah 40, verse 22. I'm sure uh, you know that quite well, uh, Michael where it says that uh, the Lord sits uh, sits upon or over the, the circle of the earth. And so um, so this is a very frequently cited uh, text. Um, so that text in and of itself, does it prove to us that the earth is round? Uh, I don't think it necessarily does because it's it's about what they're trying to say. Uh, it, it's It's like if I were to say believe in Jesus with all your heart, I'm not telling you that beliefs come from your the thing that pumps blood. I'm trying to say that love him with your innermost being. Yeah, I'm just using a common idiom to get that. The word in Isaiah, uh, what is it? Isaiah um, 40, verse 22. 42. It only shows 40, the word 40, for verse circle. 22. Yeah, Isaiah the 40. The word for verse circle 22. only shows up three times in the Bible. That yeah. word is like yeah. chug or like, like, I forget how to pronounce it. It's like, it's, yeah. it ends in like, ooh, it's hug or something like that. Yeah. It could mean vault, horizon, circle. We're not entirely sure because it's such as a limited use. But let's remember, the Bible is not trying to give you, it's not a book on geography. It's not a book on cosmology. It's a book on theology, ethics, history. It's not going to always be telling you the way the cosmos work. It's not even trying to tell you that. It's trying to tell you that God has entered into the universe and has a relationship with humans. He has set up covenants. He wants you to follow him. Here are some ethical guidelines to follow. Here is the story of history, how we got to this point of Christ coming. Here's where we're going. Okay, it's not doing cosmology. So when people try to cite verses to show scientific truths, I'm always like, oh, that's not what it's doing. It's like for me trying to read like 19th century poetry mm -hmm. and trying to derive scientific truths from that that wouldn't make sense people go it's the wrong genre what are you doing uh that mm -hmm. the poetry i mean like let's use it put it in its context same yeah. with the bible let, let's let the bible be what it is let's not try to force it to be a scientific textbook it is not 
Yeah, and when we talk about the flat, the the circle of the earth in Isaiah 40, verse 22, I mean, the, the flat earthers could argue one way, and the spherical, uh, are, uh, 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 those who believe the earth is spherical, could argue the same, right? I mean, let's look at a, a disc. A disc uh, is a flat circle. Or think of a pancake. If you guys have pancakes for breakfast, a pancake, not a perfect circle, obviously, but think of a disc. A disc is a flat, uh, a flat circle. But a basketball, a ball is also circular, circular. What Isaiah 40 verse 22 is not telling us, it's not telling us whether it's flat or spherical. All it says is the circle. And both a flat disc can be circular and a ball could be circular. They're both circular. And so Isaiah 40 verse 22 is not saying the earth is a sphere, but it's also not saying that it's a flat disc. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so you see where I'm coming from, right, Michael? In other words, the Bible is not, is not explaining to us the shape of the earth there. And in fact, in many places in the Bible, it just doesn't really go into that direction. Yeah, it, that's not what it's doing. Um, it's trying to teach you about God. Uh, and, you know, you can compare it to something like this. Like if I, if I, if I tell you, you know, think the sun's going to rise tomorrow and it's going to set tomorrow. Okay, I'm not telling you my view of cosmology that I'm actually a flat earther. I think the sun is actually going to move and rise up and then actually set. I understand the earth rotates and moves around the sun. Okay, just because I'm using these common phrases, sunrise and sunset, that does not mean I'm teaching you cosmology. Right. God can do the same. He can use phraseology of the ancient Near East. He can use words to sort of just give theological messaging. Just like he can say, believe, you know, we can say, believe God with all your heart. Okay, we, yeah. we're not trying to teach you that emotions are in the heart. Yeah, and so this phenomenological, we, we usually refer to this as phenomenological language. So sunrise, sunset. I mean, we still use that today, right? When our forecasters, you know, open the television or, or whatever, the internet, and you look at the news, the, the weather forecast, and sunrise will be at this time and sunset will be at the. Now, we don't email them and say, listen, you crazy people, you're so <laughs> unscientific. Don't you know sun does not rise, the sun does not set? So, so from our perspective, obviously, phenomenologically speaking, from our perspective, the sun does look like it's rising and the sun looks like it's setting. Um, mm -hmm. In the same case with, of course, with Joshua, in the book of Joshua, where Joshua and the, Israel, the armies of Israel are waging war and, and uh, Joshua commands the sun to stand still. Well, from their perspective, it looked like the sun wasn't moving. It, it just stood still. And so we know, of course, obviously, that a God who is the sovereign, who is the creator of these laws, he can suspend laws, he could he could do as he wishes with his creation. And so I think what happens a lot of the times is that a lot of our, our, our readers, people who read these texts, um, I think they're, they're forgetting that there is phenomenological language. And as you pointed out, Michael, you're absolutely right. You know, the emotions, the kidneys in Hebrew, in the Hebrew uh, right, uh, Old Testament, the kidneys is the seat of the emotions, right? Yeah. Well, well, on Joshua 10, just so everyone knows, on my channel tomorrow, I'm uploading a video on that topic. Oh, great. I actually I actually think that we may have misunderstood that. Some scholars have argued that it may be just using Ullman language. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you want to check that out, it'd be, it's going to be a different perspective. But in Proverbs 23, 16, that's what it says. It says, my kidneys will exalt when your lips speak what is right. Um, it's But I mean, you know, it's sort of like saying, I got a gut feeling something bad is about to happen. I don't mean feelings are in my guts. Mm -hmm. You know, I, we understand what I'm doing here is I'm saying I just got some sort of bad feeling um, I want to put out there. I'm just using an idiom. Yeah. Uh, same with in Proverbs. You could say that kind of language and you could understand it to not literally mean uh, what the words literally are. So right. there's just something in philosophy of, you know, my area, which is called speech act theory. And it's, a, it, it's been put forward kind of more recently, but it's the kind of idea that Sometimes what we say is not the literal meaning of the words. So let me give you an example. If I said, you're standing on my foot, I'm not trying to be descriptive. I'm actually trying to get you to move off my foot. Uh, you would not go, oh, yes, that is obviously happening. And just keep standing there. You would move your foot, even though I did not say move your foot. The literal meaning of my words is not to be taken as it is. Speech act theory could be compared to dad jokes. A dad joke is just ignoring the rules of speech act theory. You know, if a kid walks in and goes, I'm hungry, the dad goes, hi, hungry, I'm dad. Uh -huh. That's not what the kid was trying to get at. He's yeah. trying to say, get me some food. We do that quite often. I walk into a, a, a store and I say, do you have a bathroom? The, the store uh, employee will point me to where the bathroom is. He's not going to be like, yes, we do include one. Have a nice day. And just thinking I was asking about architectural designs of the building. That would be silly. 
So sometimes the, what we say is not the literal meaning of the word. Sometimes what we say is meant to imply some sort of other meaning that comes along with it. Same mm -hmm. with something like Proverbs 23, 16. My kidneys will rejoice when your lips speak what is right. Or I've got a gut feeling or believe Jesus with all your heart. Okay, I'm not trying to teach you physiology or biology. Proverbs 23 is not trying to do biology. It's trying to teach you theology, ethics, these kinds of things. So get what the actual meaning that's intended from this verse is. Don't try to take the literal meaning of the words. And the exact same logic applies to verses that try to say, oh, look, the earth has been firmly established. It cannot move. Or it's a, a circle or it has corners. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the same applies to the um, anthropomorphic language we find in the Bible when it, when it speaks of God, right? Psalm 91 for uh, he will cover you with his feathers and under his wings, you know, you'll find refuge. You know, no one's walking away thinking that, uh, you know, God is uh, this big chicken in the heavens uh, with wings and, and feathers. Uh, you, know, you know, maybe we should have the KFC Colonel Sanders sign in the church if that's the case. Uh, but we all understand that's metaphorical language, right? Jesus used that. I am the door. I am the bread of life. Uh, I am the vine and so forth and so on. Uh, and so uh, I think it's important that, uh, as you said, we realize that, uh, that we need to look at the text. We need to look at the language. We need to look at uh, uh, the, the figures of speech that the biblical writers employ. So for example, you know, Revelation 7 verse 1, uh, you know, talks about, John saw four angels on the four corners of the earth. Um, and so if that's the case, the earth is no longer a, a round disc. It, it's now a cube uh, mm -hmm. or a square at, at the very least. But uh, we all we understand why uh, Revelation 7, 1 refers to the angels at the four corners of the earth. Maybe, maybe you want to just say a couple of things about that, Michael. About the four corners verse? Yeah, I mean, it's apocalyptic literature, but... Yeah, well, it also mentions a beast coming out of the sea. No one thinks a beast is literally going to rise out of the sea or we think an angel is going to come down to heaven and give John a book to eat. <laughs> it's like things yeah. like this. We, yeah. Uh, we don't, you know, so it's apocalyptic language. And we see this throughout the Old Testament with like Jeremiah pronouncing prophecies on uh, Israel, uh, Ezekiel, Isaiah pronouncing prophecies on Egypt. They use this sort of hyperbolic language constantly, yeah. exaggeration. Like Isaiah 19 talks about how Yahweh is supposed to come and topple the statues of Egypt. We don't think that literally happened. We don't think he literally came down from a cloud and just knocked over a bunch of statues in Egypt. Uh, it's very common apocalyptic language. It, this is just sort of what is uh, being used throughout the Bible. Uh, mm -hmm. So with that in mind, the Bible uses a lot of metaphors, uh, like some of the examples you gave. Uh, it uses metaphorical language, hyperbolic language, constantly in apocalyptic literature. Just read Isaiah. Anytime he's announcing a prophecy on someone, he's not being entirely literal. Yahweh did not come and topple the statues of Egypt. That probably just refers to judgment that came upon Egypt when Assyria later invaded or Babylon later came and invaded. It's not literally a reference to Yahweh's going to do these kinds of things himself. So don't get too literal with places in like Revelation or, mm -hmm. you know, some of these things like that. We have to use some common sense. <laughs> I mean, it should be obvious, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know. Some people like to pick and choose the literal parts of Revelation they want. It's unfortunate. Yeah. Well, I mean, the idea of a beast with seven heads and, you know, 10 horns coming out of the Mediterranean and stamping people on the forehead with 666, uh, that, yeah, that's not something that uh, uh, I would want. That's some, That's like something, that's like having, uh, you know, a bad meatloaf dinner and having a nightmare. Um, <laughs> so, so in, in the book of Psalms as well, as you know, uh, Michael, a lot of uh, a lot of folks will uh, look at the book of Psalms and it, it talks about you mentioned earlier about the um, the earth being founded on pillars. So so the book of Psalms, for example, mentions uh, these these pillars that that God has based the earth on. And um, I mean, we all understand what the meaning of pillars refers to. Right. Oh, cool. yeah. Pillars. Yeah, pillars. Yeah. Like the earth is built on pillars. It just means that stability. God, yeah. God maintains the cosmos. God maintains the earth. And uh, wasn't and, sure where you were going with that. Yeah, I was just kind of you know nudging you along if you wanted to say something. But yeah, uh, yeah, well, they, yeah. Go ahead. I think I think we need to acknowledge. Let's say so. Let's remember something. People in Mesopotamia and in Egypt did actually think the earth was flat prior to the Greeks. Everyone just sort of assumed this was the case. If you go to Mesopotamian literature. Egyptian literature, Canaanite literature, it does refer to the earth being flat. The sun travels through the sky in the dome, goes through the underworld at night, comes yep. out. 
Yeah. Now, modern flat earthers don't think that. They think the earth is actually kind of going around the, the flat earth like this or something. Uh, so their own cosmology is actually different from the ancient cosmology. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say everyone, let's say that's what Moses believed. Let's say that's what Abraham believed. Okay. Let's just, let's just sit, give them that right now. Okay. Does that mean God believed it? Mm -hmm. No. For the same reason that if you and I traveled back in time, let's say we could go back in time and we realized that if we could go back to maybe, I don't know, the, uh, the invasion of, um, let's say we could prevent the fall of the 15th dynasty of Egypt. And we could say, look, tomorrow when the sun is rising, you're going to see an army coming up. Okay. Trust me with your heart. I'm telling you the truth, man. You got to get your men ready. Case okay, question. Did I lie to the Pharaoh of the 15th dynasty? Mm -hmm. Did I lie to him? Yeah, I don't think so. Okay, well, I told him the sun is going to rise. I told him yep. to believe me with his heart. But yep. he, an Egyptian pharaoh, would actually think emotions from the heart. The, mm -hmm. the Egyptians, when they mummified someone, they didn't they didn't think there was anything in the brain. Yeah, they mummified the organs because sure. they thought that's where the emotions were, and they thought the sun literally was moving. But you understand that I'm not. You don't take the literal meaning of my words. Mm -hmm. You take the illocution of my words, the intended meaning. I'm warning him about an incoming invasion. Likewise, God can do the same thing. He can go to Moses and say, look, I'm going to inspire you to write the word of God. Here's the meanings I want you to imbue in your culture. So even if he were to write things like sunrise or sunset or the sun's moving through the sky, we could understand the theological meaning without taking the literal meaning of the words and have to take those beliefs that everyone in the ancient years had that it, they, there was a flat earth. So this is a fallacy that the flat earthers sort of throw out. They think that just because uh, ancient people may have thought that way, well, most did, uh, that we also have to think that way because they were writing scripture. That, that's absurd. That's just a leap in logic. It does not get get you to there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a bit of the the post hoc fallacy, right? Because of this, well, then this happens, right? It's like the old farmer that uh, well, every time the cock uh, crows, the sun rises, and so somehow the 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 the, the crowing of the, of the of the cock or the rooster causes the sun to rise. Well, no, that's that's a false that's false causation. It's a false, there's a false relationship between the two. Um, mm -hmm. and, 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 and again, I know a lot of folks, uh, a lot of our viewers, I know, I know a lot of them that would agree exactly with what you said, that when the Bible speaks of sunrise, sunset, we're not assuming that the sun is moving by itself, you know, that the, the, the sun is orbiting around the earth and so forth and so on. So they understand that phenomenal language. Um, you know, the book of Psalms, as you know, is Hebrew poetry and, and it's highly metaphorical, right? It's yeah. highly metaphorical. You know, God is a rock. God is a high tower. God is a he's a he's a big bird who who covers us with his feathers and his wings and so forth. You know, he's a he's a he's a raging furnace um, and so forth. So we all understand that when when the when the book of Psalms talks about uh, pillars uh, or even the ends of the earth, you know, uh, we hear about the Bible speaks about the ends of the earth. Uh, so uh, Isaiah 45, 22, uh, one of my favorite passages in the Bible, uh, the verse that actually converted Charles Spurgeon was that verse uh, where it says, look unto me, the Lord is speaking. And Yahweh says, look unto me, all the ends of the earth and be saved. Uh, well, obviously the ends of the earth there is not talking about the parameters of, of the planet. It's obviously talking about the peoples, the, mm -hmm. the, the peoples, the nations. Uh, or Yahweh is calling the nations at the ends of the earth to look to him and be saved. Uh, and so this language of ends of the earth uh, is not talking about this, you know, this this precipice that if you go way a little too far, you know, they're, they're going to fall over and there's, you know, there's there's a dragon out there or something of that nature. So I think it's important for people to realize that that language is is clearly uh, speaking about people there. Yeah. Also, I mean, you go to Hebrews 7. Hebrews 7 is a great place because it says, for Levi was still in the loins of his ancestor, Abraham, when Melchizedek met him. Yeah. Okay, do you think that Levi like was pre-existent prior to his conception? No. I don't think anyone does. I think we agree Levi came into existence at conception. He was not sort of like floating around in the loins of Abraham prior to his to uh, Abraham uh, conceiving Isaac and then conceiving Jacob and then conceiving Levi. That would be ridiculous to think that. But so right. if you're going to take the Bible entirely literal, you got to believe that hey, Levi was pre-existent. Um, mm -hmm. but that sounds heretical to me. So, um, yeah. you got to be very careful with how you do this kind yeah. of thing. And so flat earthers are picking and choosing the mm -hmm. parts of the Bible. They want to be literal. Mm -hmm. They can't take revelation seven, one and Isaiah 42 or Isaiah 40, 22, both the same. Cause one says the earth is a circle. One says the earth is corners. Make up your right. mind. Right. Right. Yeah. And so I think that, I think that, um, 
we need to understand that when we we look at scripture and again you know especially in the evangelical tradition we 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 believe the scriptures are are our ultimate authority that they're they're uh they're inerrant in their original writings and that we believe in the principle of sola scriptura and so it behooves us as christians to properly uh divide the word of truth uh and be responsible interpreters of the word of god um and so that would also involve being able to look at passages that that use metaphorical language about the earth and and recognize you know what i always tell my students michael is that when you read scripture when you read these passages try to put yourselves in the place of the original audience the original hearers what did the original hearers understand by this uh when they heard these words um and and so because obviously they, they didn't have the acumen the intellectual acumen that we would have today with astronomy and, and cosmology and, and so forth and so on and so I, I think it's it's very important that as if we take the scriptures as God's inspired word, then, you know, James 3 says not many of you should be teachers because your judgment will be more severe. Uh, and so I think it's, it's a clarion call, isn't it, Michael, for us to be, uh, you know, dividing the word of truth uh, accurately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. And so, you know, it comes with discernment. You got to be able to discern these types of things. Uh, but to just read too much into certain texts and try to derive scientific truth is just a category error. Yeah. It'd be like me trying to uh, get mathematics out of a cooking book. You could find numbers in a cooking book. But that doesn't mean it's going to teach you algebra. Yeah. Same thing with the Bible. It's not trying to do astronomy, geography, uh, calculate the circumference of the earth. The mm -hmm. early church fathers said that nature was the 67th book of the Bible. So let nature help us understand the Bible better. And even the critics of Galileo said that when this is going on, they said, if we're wrong, all it means is that our interpretation of scripture is wrong and we'll have to adjust that. That's yeah. that's the humble approach. We cannot just yeah. sort of forge our interpretation as if it's dogma. Yeah, yeah. And that tradition goes way back to, I mean, St. Augustine back in the in the fifth century. Uh, that's one of the things he said when you come to a, a, a reading in the Bible and there's there's you don't understand it. Uh, he, he said it, it's either there's a textual variant uh, or it's possible that our interpretation is off. Uh, but, but since scripture cannot err, it, it has to be either our interpretation or we don't have enough information to, to inform us, or it could be a textual variant. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and so, and of course, you know, the one thing I admire about St. Augustine was that even near the end of his life, he, he wrote, a, a, you know, the retractiones, the retractions, where he he went through his works and and basically wrote retractions or an errata where he points out the various uh, mistakes he made or he would say well i don't hold to that anymore so he was a very very uh let's say uh discerning loyal theologian and philosopher i might add mm -hmm. yeah i absolutely agree uh yeah. and so i think we would need to take his work more seriously for sure yeah Let's talk a little bit about the, uh, you know, one of the things I think uh, that uh, Draper and White also accused that the church of doing was holding to this, you know, the geocentric model that the earth is the center of the universe. Uh, and of course, um, I've never read that in scripture. I, I, there's nothing in scripture that seems to indicate at all that the, uh, the planet earth is the center of the universe um and so maybe you can comment on that as well michael this idea that the earth was the center and then when copernicus and galileo uh you know they they dismantled that whole concept the church went into a frenzy and and a, a shock because we're no longer the center of the world and god's attention and therefore it it, it opened the door to secular humanism so there's so much so much stuff that is packed into this that mm -hmm. you, know, you really have to go with a fine comb and just you know, take out all the, the, the myth that has just accrued. So the problem is, is that there, that's just the exact opposite. Uh, in Gal the book, Galileo goes to jail and other myths about science. Um, chapter six, Dennis Danielson addresses this. The title of the chapter is that Co the myth six, the Co that Copernicanism demoted humans from the center of the cosmos. Right. Right. Uh, actually, uh, the, the theological problem was, is they thought being further out would be better. So that, you know, being in the center was sort of like being at like the, the bottom of the trash can. I guess you could be an analogy for that. It was actually better to be up with the stars. So you're moving the earth away from the center. You're, you're, you're giving us too much praise. Like we should be, you know, further down because we're just these lowly creatures was kind of the, the more of the idea that they were getting at. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was more of what was going on there. Now the church 
did believe in a geocentric model for quite some time because they were going on what the science said. And when the right. science updated with right. Kepler Newton, they updated as well. But again, when Copernicus came out with his idea that the planets went around the sun, sun that's the only thing he got right. Okay, he everything they, they knew about physics at the time violated Greek. It by everything we knew about Greek physics violated the Copernican model. Planets just cannot move like that. It took the work of Kepler to know, you know, if you have elliptical models, it, it would actually explain it better. And the church was fine with that. Mm -hmm. So when that came out, it was perfectly fine. And when the data supported it, they went. So I forget the name of the model. It was like the, the Thai Korean model, I think it was. It was also okay. competing with the Galilean model. Okay. Uh, I forget exactly how to say it. It was another model at the time. And it thought that maybe, maybe the, um, Earth went around, uh, uh, I believe it says something like the sun goes around the earth and all the planets go around the sun. So it thought, so this was another model at the time of Galileo. And it was trying to say like, well, you know, the way we're sort of seeing physics at the time, uh, where they were sort of made the observations we're seeing in the sky could support this other model. And for a short time, the evidence was sort of favoring it until once again, Kepler and Newton came along and showed, no, actually it's this. So, uh, they did, the church did sort of hold to these models, but again, they were not nailed down to them like they were dogma. They were willing to change when the data went there. The Copernican model did not provide sufficient evidence to allow for this change because, again, it just didn't. the physics did not support it. So people need to get what the actual history right. The church was going on the best data at the time. Right. Uh, they And so when, you know, this was all going down, it was not some sort of like, no, the church has always taught this and we will not change. That's not true because they did change the moment it happened. Right, right, and I think it's Claudius Ptolemaeus uh, that 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 pushed this idea of the the geocentric uh, model of the universe, uh, and so this was based on science. That is science of the day until it was again challenged by Copernicus. Uh, I mean, are, are you going to get mad at people in the 1800s for not believing in quantum mechanics? Yeah, I mean that's what it's like. They yeah. didn't know these kinds of things yet. Right, right, and so and so I think it's fair to say that. I, I, there's there's a common uh, charge that you know the, the Roman Catholic Church uh, you know they 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 opposed Galileo and so forth. But I think it's important to realize for our viewers that uh, it's not just you know this isn't just a Roman Catholic thing. Uh, you need to understand that the reformers, Martin Luther and John Calvin, opposed Copernicus and, and the, the theory that is. So so this isn't just a Roman Catholic papacy uh, uh, attack. On science, uh, it, it was it was actually Western Christendom. I think the East was too busy trying to defend itself from the Turks and, and the Muslims and so forth, the Eastern Church. But it's, insofar as the West goes, uh, Luther and Calvin both uh, condemned Copernicus uh, in terms of his theory. He was already dead by that time. Um, so I, I just want to be fair here to history that it's not just the Roman Catholics or the Papists, uh, so called, but. Uh, the reformers opposed them as well, particularly Luther and Calvin. And again, at the time, uh, there historians have done surveys of this. At the time, there was only about 13 men that held to the, a pure heliocentric model because it was just really hard to get the science to support it. Uh, so you know, there was only about 13 or 15 or so that were holding to this sort of idea. But again, once Kepler started coming up with this stuff, things started to change. And about in the late 1600s, I mean, Kepler put forward three proofs and in the late 1600s, his final proof was sort of proven. So people were like, okay, yeah, this is the way to go. And it just sort of happened. Like you don't hear about the trials of Kepler or his supporters because oh. that's they, the, the church did not persecute him. They just didn't want Galileo teaching Copernican model as a theory, which at the time would have been sort of like a proven fact. He could teach it as a hypothesis. He was like, nope, I'm teaching it as a proven theory. Yeah, and these guys again, just to just to emphasize this point, these guys were committed uh, Christians. They 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 were committed to the Christian faith. They didn't lose faith in God. Kepler was a devout Christian. Uh, Newton. I mean, there's some question about Newton being a Unitarian, uh, but uh, he was a theist. Uh, and also, um, we also know that Galileo, despite his you know his cant cantankerous uh, relationship to the Pope, and we also know he was. Pretty foul-mouthed as well, uh, and uh, you know, you know, where Galileo spat, the grass never grew green again. But uh, Galileo, to his dying day, re remained uh, faithful to God and to the to, to the Word of God and and to his faith in God. He never his faith was never diminished uh, or lost. Uh, so I, I mean, strong Catholic, very strong Catholic, yeah. did not like the reformers. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. But these men did not lose faith in God as creator of, of the universe, and, and it didn't dismantle their faith in, in God. Let's just talk briefly, and then we'll take some questions. I know a lot of our viewers have questions. Um, so a little bit about, again, the Earth being spherical. When there's a lunar eclipse, uh, when we observe a lunar eclipse, um, it's pretty obvious uh, that you could see the curvature of the Earth. <laughs> The moon, am I right? <laughs> yeah, it is obvious. I mean, it, it's observable. You could see it with the naked eye. And the, you know, these are arguments that ancient Greek philosophers used as well. Yeah, I mean, this, this was nothing new. I mean, yeah. everyone knew this back then. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, yeah, you can see the curvature actually happening. And so, again, there are there are plenty of people on YouTube that have shown these and sort of models trying to debunk flat Earth. I I honestly have a hard time just dealing with him because i'm just like if you believe the earth is flat i just it, it's so far out in left field that i just can't even take it seriously like you know i just want to hit him with that with a textbook and go, okay now come on stop this this is ridiculous now come on come on come on like <laughs> you, i'll debate a lot of people i'm not debating flat earth because i just cannot take such a ridiculous view seriously mm -hmm. and folks just to let you know that uh michael is not just uh making things up here on the fly he he has debated uh, Del Hunty, I believe it was Del Hunty, right? Uh, you, you, I've the, debated the, a lot of atheists. Yeah, I've made, been in Matt Del Hunty, Aaron Rock, debated young earth creationists. Uh, in a couple of weeks, I'll be in Houston at the Capturing Christianity Conference yeah. to debate Marcus Ross on if the Bible is compatible with evolution. Right, right. And so, folks, it's important to realize, once again, that uh, it's not that Michael is just throwing these things out there. He, he does debate various uh, various people in this field, atheists and so forth. And, and as I said, it's not that Michael and I see eye to eye on everything, um, but in terms of his, his, his uh, argumentation, he's willing to put his neck out to debate these things publicly uh, with those who oppose the Christian faith. So, um, Michael, can we take some questions? Sure, go for it. Okay, so folks, again, if you have any questions, please place a Q capital Q in front of your uh, your uh, name there. And uh, the first question here I see, uh, this is from uh, good friend Steve Christie. Uh, does Michael know if the Quran or the Hadith teach a flat earth or is just something uh, some Muslims believe? Uh, I think there's something about the sun setting in a muddy pool, but I'm yeah. not an expert on this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, am, I try to apply the principle of charity when it comes to that, because I want the principle of charity applied to the Bible as well. So if there are other interpretations that can get around that, that it doesn't actually teach that, fine, let's go for it. I'm not yeah. going to be yeah. not going to be like hailed down to, no, the Quran has to teach that the earth is flat. Right. Like, I'm, I'm willing to be charitable there. Let's just yeah. say that. Yeah, yeah. I've I've studied Islam for, for many, many years. And uh, so the Quran does give a, a very literalistic flat earth idea. Uh, and the Hadith do teach the same thing. Um, it talks about the, uh, it does talk about the, the, uh, the Quran says that the sun sets in a muddy spring and that is why darkness comes. And then it goes under the, it prostrates under before the throne of Allah. And then it comes up again, the other end. The Hadith is very clear that Muhammad took this very literally. Uh, he never said it was metaphorical, never said it was, um, it was figurative. Uh, he clearly taught that the sun literally sets in a muddy spring and that it goes under the earth and that it comes up the other end. So uh, unlike the Bible, um, the Bible does not go to that extent, but the Quran supplemented with the Hadith clearly teaches that this is something that Muhammad himself took very literally. He didn't believe it was metaphorical. Uh, so on that point, I would say, having read the Quran, studied the Hadith, studied Islam, uh, that uh, that is the picture that we're presented. Um, and a lot of Muslims, you can go on YouTube, there's a lot of Muslim imams who will come out and defend the flat earth and, and claim, quote, the very things I just said. Um, and, and so, um, yeah, uh, Muslims have a way of making the, uh, the Quran uh, and Islam malleable, uh, Michael, to, uh, for example, they'll claim that it talks about the Big Bang in the Quran. It doesn't do that. Uh, it even talks about, they'll say that it teaches embryology, that, you know, that, that, that from the stage of the zygote to the embryo and so forth, it doesn't do that. Uh, and, and so a lot of Muslims in the West, they try to make the Quran, they try to adjust the Quran to, to modern day science and cosmology to make Islam winsome. Um, and, and so again, we, we, we just need to be careful. And, and I like what you said there, Michael, that we need to be fair, that we're not, we're not using one set of rules for the Bible that we're not willing to set for another text. We need to be consistent. 
in our uh, in our uh, methodology. We need mm -hmm. to be consistent. Okay, uh, let me see. Let me just move on here. Um, yeah, yes, uh, Steve Christie, I do try to sing once in a while. Um, so there are two types of people in the church, right, folks? There's those who sing to the Lord, make a joyful noise to the Lord, and there are those who sing to the Lord, right? Some just make a joyful noise. Others uh, sing. And then there, then there were people like me. They cause wailing and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's move along here. See if we have. Uh, uh, okay. We have a question here from this is from Crossing Jordan. Is Earth the only planet <laughs> that is flat? Uh, when we view a full moon, it's round. What am I missing here? Well, we discussed that already, uh, uh, Linda. We, we did talk about the curvature of the Earth being visible on the surface of the moon during a lunar eclipse. Um, and uh, no, I think it's fair to say that all the planets are uh, spherical. Yeah. Anything you want to add to that, uh, Michael? Or Well, the flat earthers will say we can look up and observe the planets and see the round, but we, we can't do that for the Earth. And I'm like, yes, we can. <laughs> it's, called, uh -huh. it's, called sat it's called satellite imagery. Like, it's not hard. Right. right. And and even the claims that it's been doctored. Um, uh, again, this this claim that these these photos are simply doctored. Uh, is 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 a, is a standard comeback that I hear all the time, Michael. That uh, well, how do you know NASA didn't play with it? How do we know NASA didn't Photoshop them? How do we know that uh, these things are are, are just uh, not doctored? Um, did you just want to add anything to that? I think we mentioned it earlier, but again, Photoshop was not around in the '60s. It's not around in the '50s when we were taking these photos. What do you yeah. think they were doing? Okay, this is this is absurd. They, they yes, in the photos they will enhance the earth so it shows bright like getting rid of the stars behind it because that's just the nature of looking at things in space but to think they were able to do these massive like computer imaging in you know photoshopping when computers weren't even out is just beyond the pale like you got to look at the actual technology at the time and a lot of flat earthers judge uh the photos with as if they had modern technology and there's just no evidence that existed that mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. Well, this just uh, this is just an example. I just wanted to bring this up from Wesley Tyler that I'm not a flat earther, but I have family who are. We are Christians. You guys in the comment sec section don't seem to understand the flat earth position. Yeah. So, I mean, this this is just what we mentioned at the outset of the uh, program, uh, Michael, that this is an issue. Unfortunately, and this is sad, but in some cases, this has been a cause of division. Um, I know a pastor personally who has lost people in his church. Um, who have left because of this, because the, the pastor doesn't hold to this flat earth idea. Um, and as if somehow it had to be in their statement of faith, but um, this has caused division in the body of Christ. And it's sad. It really is sad to see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. It's really unfortunate. Okay. Um, so someone, um, John Basquette asked, uh, yeah. uh, Giordano Bruno martyred him for believing in modern astronomy. No, Bruno was more like the Deepak Chopra of the day. He chastised Copernicus for relying too much on measurement, not enough on intuition. Uh, he was put on trial. He was part of a specific Catholic order, and he was put on trial for violating the doctrines of that Catholic order. Now, as, as a free speech guy, as a free expression guy, I do not agree that he should have been executed by the church. Okay, I, that, that was wrong. I think we can all agree that was wrong. He should not be executed for having different beliefs. But he was not put on trial for doing science. He was put on trial for heretical beliefs that he held to. So again, he was more like a, a mystic of the day. He wasn't okay. doing measurements. He wasn't going out and doing science. He was um, the Deepak Chopra. So the history is actually right. And if you go to um, historyforatheist.com, Tim O'Neill has got a great article on Bruno. He goes into the history and shows this. Yeah, I think it's also important to realize that, uh, again, going back to uh, medieval Europe, um, it was uh, an ecclesiastical crime at the time to promote heresy. Um, and, you know, the whole, the whole issue with Michael Servetus and, and uh, you, you commonly hear people accusing Calvin, but this was the law of, of the land. Um, and that's what generally the, the European councils would pass judgment. And heretics, if you denied the Trinity or denied other central cardinal, cardinal doctrines of the Christian faith, more often than not, you ended up at the at the stake, um, and 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 even if you may may have Anabaptist leanings that say, well, you know, the, the separation of church and state, this is just the way it was, and and we need to understand that this was the the climate of of 
uh, medieval Europe at the time. This was the way law worked. And and so we're not here to, you know, we're not here to sanitize history uh, or even sanitize the history of the church. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that historically bad stuff has happened in the history of the church as well. But uh, we need to put it in context that Bruno was not, uh, this isn't Bruno Mars, by the way. Uh, Bruno was <laughs> not, uh, Bruno was not uh, executed because of science. Um, mm -hmm. We already addressed this, uh, Michael, uh, that, uh, you know, Isaiah 40, 22, um, uh, that the earth is flat like a desk. It doesn't say it's flat. It just says the circle. Uh, a yeah. sphere, a sphere is circular as well, and and a disc yeah. is circular. So that that could also mean compass or horizon. We're not entirely sure what that word fully means because again, it only shows up three places in the Hebrew Bible. Right, right. Okay. Um, yeah. So S Steve, Chris, Tony Costa, some great dad jokes. Uh, I do, I do, but it's a very serious topic tonight. So I'm just gonna, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna pass on that right now. Uh, okay, let me see if we have any other questions. There's more towards the end, I saw. Yeah, okay. There's another one here. Many flat earthers use the book of Enoch and believe it's inspired. What's the best arguments to refute this? I know you have some videos out on that as well, Michael. Yeah, I got a video uh, called The Book of Enoch Examined on my channel where we go into it and show this is a, very, uh, this is a late forgery. This is not something that goes back to the historical Enoch. It, it, yeah. re it speaks as if it already knows the book of Jeremiah exists. So it's dated to, you know, the post-exilic period. Uh, and it's also heretical. People don't realize this, but Enoch actually contains heresy. Where? Well, it says that Enoch is the Messiah. Yeah, the son of so man. So it actually yeah. comes out and says that, you know, you are the son of man. Because Enoch is like showing all these visions of the son of man. And then he goes, oh, by the way, that's you, Enoch. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, um, you can't have this in the Bible. It teaches that Enoch is the Messiah. That's why it's not in the Bible, and there's no evidence anyone in in um, anyone in the Jewish community like uh, ever really considered it to be part of Scripture or part of the Tanakh. The Tanakh. Yeah. So it's just a pseudo work. Yeah, yeah, and even its appearance in the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, a lot of Jews read a lot of other stuff. It wasn't just the Bible. Uh, some of it, for some, it was devotion. Some of it is just interest, just like you would you would have, you know, C.S. Lewis or. Oswald Chambers or whatever devotional works you're into or the Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, you know, no one takes that. No one takes that literally, right? No one believes that a lion is, you know, it's obviously a picture of Christ, but no one believes Jesus is literally a lion. Um, so, yeah. So thanks for that question again, uh, Sarah. Uh, we have the other Paul here. The other Paul. Oh, the other Paul. Uh, yeah, I think this is the other Paul from, I think it's our brother in Australia in the land down under. Uh, good day. All right. So is it most helpful for us to consider such texts as written in a phenomenological manner? That is, the sun appears to rise and fall and the earth appears like a disk rather than ontological. I think I think uh, you may have joined us a little later, Paul, but I, I we did address that. So uh, you want to yeah. add that? You just you want to add something very quickly to that, Michael? I think we did address that. I, th I think I agree. We talked about the ph phenomenological language, yeah. and we talked a little bit about speech act theory earlier on, where we showed that it's you, you understand the illocution, not the locution of the words. Right. Right. Okay. So let's uh, let's move on here. Uh, all right. Okay. Um, we have a question here. Uh, why do rivers run down to the seaside? Why is there day and night? Why are there seas and stay away from the matrix? <laughs> and God isn't surprised by stupidity of men's desires. Mm -hmm. Earth not flat. Um, Anything you want to comment on there? I don't know what they're trying to say. Yeah, yeah. Rivers do run down. They always do run down. Uh, that's that's how we know Eden was was on was built was created on a mountain because there's four rivers that go out of Eden, and uh, Ezekiel talks about it as the mountain of God. And so, anyway, I'm um, getting off into theological uh, uh, discussion here. Uh, okay, so let's see. Uh, we have some more questions here. Um, Okay, we have another one from Steve Christie. Uh, I think he's commenting to Sarah. That's because they don't have any objective standards for what belongs in the Bible. Maybe that would be a question to ask them what are their objective standards. Okay, we need more context for that. Um, okay, let me see. Do we have any more questions here? And so, folks. Yeah, there was a lot towards the mid. Towards when you oh, here's another one. Here's uh, here's our good friend, Doctor Jonathan McClatchy. Uh, how do people get drawn into a conspiracy theory like that flat earth that is so obviously false? What sort of demographic is represented by flat earthers? 
So there was a study that came out in 2017. The title is I Know Things They Don't Know, The Role of Need for Uniqueness and Belief in Conspiracy Theories. And what they showed is that people that tend to buy into conspiracy theories like Flat Earth, uh, tend to, it comes from a desire to feel unique, to feel special, to want to stand out. So this is backed by an actor. They did several studies in, in this actual paper and demonstrated this. Uh, so it, it comes from this desire to want to stand out. And I think it's just a symptom of our culture. We, we, we live in Disney culture. We, we all have to be the main character of our own story and feel unique somehow. So if you're just, you know, a regular construction worker, you work a nine to five, or you stock shelves at Costco, you're not really unique. You know, what do you, what do, you do to stand out? Well, you, you get into these conspiracy theories and feel like you're part of the secret underground society that knows the truth about reality. And you really want to, you know, be a part of something that really makes you feel special. That really is where it comes from, unfortunately, in my view, uh, because it doesn't come from evidence. There, there's no evidence for flat earth. It's, it's absurd. It, it's to the point of, of just silliness. Like, I, I if anyone tells me they're flat earth, I'd probably chuckle every time because I'm just like, OK, come on. No, you're not. Like, that's just ridiculous. So. I think all humans in some way want to feel unique. And I think this is just a way that people sort of try to feel unique. So I would say, you know, it, it's probably just from some sort of like unfortunate psychological effects. Yeah. And, and I've also noted as well that there, there's a lot of parallels with, uh, with the cults. Uh, a, a lot of folks who are trapped in cults that claim to have this, you know, this secret knowledge or this esoteric knowledge no one else has. So there's a, there's a tinge of Gnosticism there that you've got this elite knowledge. I'm part of this elite group, this elite club. Uh, you know, all of you guys are ignorant. You're all sleeping. You need to wake and, and wake up to light and so forth. So th there, there does tend to be almost a cultic atmosphere in some of these groups uh, mm -hmm. as well. We have a question here. This is uh, on uh, if the Bible does not intend to teach anything about science, how are we to understand Adam and Eve? Are these only allegorical figures? No, I think they, the Bible speaks of them as if they are real historical figures. Uh, they Adam shows up in genealogies, Genesis 5. Uh, Paul speaks about him as an historical person. Uh, but again, just because they show up, that doesn't mean everything said about them is literal. Genesis 2, 24, man shall leave his father and mother and the two shall become one flesh. Okay, that's not literal. Uh, so we need to understand that sometimes real historical people can be spoken about in metaphorical ways. But I think the Bible is pretty clear they were real historical people. I do believe in historical Adam and Eve, even though I'm a theistic evolutionist. I believe they were the first priests of creation. Uh, that was what Eden was. It was the first temple. They were the priests that were set up there, and they fell, broke the covenant. All die in Adam now. He was the priest that failed, and now Christ is the priest who succeeded, and we're all made alive in him. Okay. Uh, there's a question here. I think it's referring to... Uh, uh, to a debate, is he willing? I'm, I'm, I'm assuming he's referring to you, Michael. Is no he one, no one has. Okay, I don't. I know a little about this person. No one has emailed me or messaged me asking me about these types of things. I don't respond to a bunch of public uh, proclamations. Debate this guy because they're just honor challenges. Right. I, if you want to set up a debate, message me. We'll see when I have time. But right now I'm booking things out to like January because I got done with school and I got flooded with interview and message requests that like are, you know, so I'm, I'm already planning out a bunch of other debates. So mm -hmm. if it's happened, it, it's way off. Right. Uh, but right. people need to actually message me. I'm not just going to, I'm not going to play this stupid game of, of public honor challenges. Right. Right. Okay, uh, so another question from Steve. Since eclipses prove around Earth, can we assume the biblical writers saw it, uh, deduce this, or did they deduce this? Since eclipses prove around Earth, can we assume the biblical writers who saw it deduce this? Uh, maybe. Again, they're, they're not, it's entirely possible some of them may have deduced this, uh, mm -hmm. but again, they don't really tell us. So we don't really, it's one of those things we just have to be agnostic on. Uh, we don't have to, you know, it's like, what did, what did Abraham eat for breakfast on, you know, the, the, the 50th day of his, on his 50th birthday? Well, I don't know. I don't need to know. <laughs> like, it's not in the no. Bible. So I no. don't need to know their beliefs about these types of things. That's not what yeah. they are writing about. It's like, yeah. you know, you can get some really good stuff from Isaac Newton with, with while rejecting his Unitarian beliefs. I don't mm -hmm. have to accept every belief he had. Yeah, yeah. Um, someone's asking here, uh, when, uh, let me see here. Uh when are you coming to Houston? Um, let me pull the, the conference up. So it's the Capturing Christianity Conference in Houston. Uh, it'll be, I believe it's August 4th to the 6th. 
Uh, so it's, it's coming up right. I'm going to be flying out for that, I think, in like two weeks or something. Uh, but yeah, it's August 4th to the 6th. It's at Cross Point Church in Bel Air. Uh, tickets are on sale now at capturingchristianity.com. I'll be debating Marcus Ross on if Genesis is compatible with evolution. Uh, William Lane Craig might be there. I know he's supposed to give some sort of presentation. Sigart's going to be there. Uh, Andrew Moon, Josh Schwamadas, Jim Tor. Uh, so a lot of great speakers are going to be there. Um, Erica Carlson, Tyler McNabb, a lot of great stuff. I'm also going to be doing a breakout session on Exodus and all the evidence we have for the Exodus. So a lot of good stuff going to happen. You can come out. I'll be there if you live in the Houston area. And so, yeah, hope to see you there. All right. That's why they always said uh, we made contact, Houston. <laughs> all right. Okay. So uh, uh, where did the giant tortoise come from? I'm assuming that's probably referring to the, you know, the myth about the earth resting on the back of a, of a turtle with four elephants. I think that comes out of Hinduism. So, yeah, the last I checked, it actually might be a modern myth that was sort of put on Hinduism. Mm -hmm. I don't know entirely, but the last I looked at it, it, it was sort of this sort of made up like Westerners were mocking Hinduism, but I'm not entirely sure on that. So I don't, I wouldn't take that as dogma that it comes out of Hinduism. It may have been something used to mock them. Right, right. Well, we've got a, a shout out here for you, uh, Michael. Uh, well, Steve says, since Isaiah 40, 22 isn't explicit that the earth is round, is there a pastor that implies it? Uh, great YouTube sh uh, shorts, Michael. I think that's I referring to your TikTok. Yeah. Yeah, appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's a, a passage that explicitly states that, like there's not a passage that explicitly tells us the circumference of the earth or tells us that quantum mechanics is real or that the, you know, or that um, the, the, the uh, universe is expanding and getting faster. It just, it's just not what its focus is on. It's like trying to get these ideas on a cookbook. That's not what the subject matter is. Let the Bible be what it is. Don't try to force it to be something it's not. Right. Uh, another question here on, on um, uh, what's a good way to swing discussion from flat earth to the gospel? Well, it depends on the person. I mean, you just got to go back and remind them that it's about Christ. It's not about the shape of the earth. Uh, flat earthers and round earthers can go to heaven if they believe in Christ. Your belief in the shape of the earth does not change that. I think we just need to focus on that. I think a lot of people who think that, you know, to be saved, you got to believe the earth is 6,000 years old, or you can't drink alcohol. You can only read the King James, or you got to keep all the Torah regulations. Like you got to keep the Sabbath and the dietary laws. It's funny how people constantly want to try to help the gospel along. And really, we don't need that stuff to be saved. Uh, let, let's let the gospel be what it is. Let's not try to help God. Uh, he did not add these extra regulations to sort of get us to salvation. So right. you don't have to believe a specific shape of the earth to be saved. And I think if you note that, know what the gospel is. That's just the best way to do it. Okay. Uh, question here on uh, how do you resolve Genesis 131, 2, 1 to 3, and Exodus 20, 11? Uh, uh, in your view of a long age and evolution, are you putting Exodus 20 as being something that the Lord God Almighty did not say? No, because I believe the days are literal seven days. I, I, I do because I hold the, the uh, temple inauguration view that there was that God inaugurated the cosmos to be his temple in seven days. So I don't think it's about material creation, and I can make that argument from several lines, uh, like the uh, Hebrew verb, Hebrew verb para, as well as asa, uh, the the actual grammatic, uh, the actual grammar of Genesis one one as well. So no, I, it is not a problem for me. Okay. Yeah, people always uh, assume they know what my interpretation of Genesis is, and then they're like, "Oh yeah, well, what about this? You don't think there's seven little days?" I'm like, "Yes, I do. You just don't right. know my interpretation because right. you don't actually." Listen and that's to and that's why it's so great. It's so awesome to ask these questions because that's the only way you'll know. You yeah. ask the questions so you can get answers. That's great. Uh, so uh, Michael here, Bible Care and Chair Fellowship. Does Michael believe in death and cosmos before the fall? Romans five twelve. Okay, uh, although, let's just again, it's not related to our topic, but anyway, well, while, while we have you, Michael. Let's just read Romans 5, starting with verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sin. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses. Okay, let's stop there. Did people stop dying after Moses showed up? Well, no. That That's not what it's saying. Later in the, um, the chapter, it says, verse 17, it says, for if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned, there it is, death reigning again, through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so the act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. 
Does Christ make us physically alive? No, we, be, we become, become the spiritual life the moment we accept Christ. This is about when we spiritually died. Human, human, humanity fell in the garden. We lost access to the tree of life. What did Moses do? Verse 14, he brought the children of Israel back into the promised land. So a promised land like Eden, special land, where the presence of God was. So it's again, now they're spiritually alive. They have the law. They can start working through this. This is sort of the theology we see throughout Romans. He gets to the differences between the Mosaic law and the new covenant later. But this is what he's getting at. This is about spiritual life. It's not about when physical death entered the world. Joshua John Anvini's dissertation, Death in the Garden, makes a pretty convincing case that death existed before the fall. He notes that uh, Genesis 9, when it, it's giving the commandment that humans can eat meat, there's no temporal indicators in that passage. It's actually a restatement of the covenant already given in Genesis 1.28. Humans were already allowed to eat meat uh, based on that because you compare this. And even Philo saw this, that Genesis 9 was just a restatement of the covenant given in Genesis 1 that they were already allowed to eat meat. The difference is Genesis 9 takes it from the animal perspective, and Genesis 1 is speaking from the human perspective. You can use animals for whatever purpose you need them for. Likewise, in Genesis 9, you know, the fear and dread will be upon them because you can use them for whatever you want. So there very much is the idea they were allowed to eat meat on that. And also, God says to subdue the earth. That's a very harsh term in Hebrew. It refers to conquest, enslavement. It's the idea that, guys, the earth need, needs subdued. Well, if it was already perfect, what, what's going on? Why is he saying that it needs subdued? What's well, the idea that God is a relational being. He wants to work with humanity to make the wor world to do something better. That was the whole setup. I've created the earth. Let's go take it to the next level now, and I want to work through my creation to do that. We fell, and we needed Christ to come back to, to restart that process over again. Yeah, I think you upset all the PETA folks, uh, Michael, with all your talk about animals and, <laughs> and killing them and, and eating them and everything like that. So yeah, proper exegesis upsets a lot of people. But that's what it is. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, so I think uh, I don't see any other questions here. Uh, we do have, okay, someone, someone's just popped up. Uh, Wesley Tyler, when can we expect Michael's video on Joshua 10? I think you said that tomorrow, Michael? Tomorrow around two ish. I guess I'll premiere it then or so. Two Pacific times, so like five Eastern, I guess, would be probably be a good time to do it, I think. That sounds fine. Yeah, two no. tomorrow. Um, so yeah, I'll be going into the ancient Near Eastern context of Joshua 10 and showing that we may have understood misunderstood that. Sort of like we may say the sky is falling. We don't actually mean the sky is falling. It's an idiom. So that right. may also be what's happening. And there's a lot of ancient Near Eastern parallels that we can look at to see this. Yeah. So folks, again, uh, the, the link to uh, Michael's uh, YouTube channel is in the description box. So if you guys uh, go over there, uh, subscribe, uh, you'll be notified when that video is going to be released. So uh, just a question here, uh, is Yahweh an extraterrestrial? <laughs> yes, clearly. I, I, was, I was expecting this question. Uh, is Yahweh an extraterrestrial? He is not from Earth, uh, Terra. Uh, he created Earth with his word. So there's a lot of folks out there saying things like that. Yeah, I just did a TikTok video recently responding uh, yeah. to some guys saying the, the gods of the Bible are the Egyptian gods. They're really anti like Atlantean Anunnaki people. And I was like, Yeah. No, yeah. they're not. They're not. This is ridiculous. No, that that is not what is going on in the Bible. And there is not a Hebrew scholar that thinks that. Yeah. 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 And the same, you know, we we hear we see uh, we see similar things uh, every Christmas, you know. Uh, uh, Osiris, you know, the Christ figure was taken from Horus, and Horus was born on December 25th. And yeah, it, it, every year, either at Easter or Christmas, as you know, Michael, all the all the uh, Hislop disciples come out of their come out of their uh, out of the closets, and they start coming up with all these weird connections of Christmas to Babylonian mystery religions and so forth. Oh, that's utter nonsense. Yeah, and, and and folks, by the way, if you if you do have the Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. Please, please. I'm not telling you to destroy books. I don't believe in destroying books. I'm not telling you to use it as Kindle, uh, Kindle uh, paper. But, but just keep that on. On just, just be aware <clears throat> that Hislop is responsible for a lot of these conspiracy theories you hear today about so-called allegations of connections between uh, uh, Nimrod or Nimrud and Semiramis and. And the whole thing about Christianity boring from these Babylonian mystery religions and so forth. Uh, be very cautious. Hislop was not a good researcher. He was not a professional in Mesopotamian studies or Egyptology. So please, please, please don't use that as a standard reference book. 
Uh, a lot of scholars have come out and have dismantled uh, Hislop's arguments uh, piece by piece. Uh, did you want to say anything about Hislop at all, Michael? Yeah, he yeah he's he's a farce. I mean, people just sort of. I, I actually had a conversation with someone on TikTok recently, and he was spouting these ideas, and I'm like, "You're getting all getting this all from Hislop." He didn't even know who he was. <laughs> so a lot of Hislop's ideas are just out there, and people see them on the internet. They assume they're true, and they don't realize they go back to him. Yeah. Uh, Sem if Sem Semiramis was a real historical person, she would have lived around the year 1000. Well, that's about what, eighth century BC. Something like that, yeah, around that time. Nimrod would have lived, you know, like over a millennia prior to that, Yeah, depending yeah. on who you identify him with. But yeah. he was nowhere would have been near, near around her. Right, right. And, and Hislop, by the way, folks, is also is used today by, by Jehovah's Witnesses and other cults in their arguments against the Trinity and, and, and things of that nature. So please, please, please be cautious. Put a yellow sticker on there with caution. Uh, you may want to use it as a reference to show where he went off into the deep end, but please don't cite Hislop as an authority. He definitely is not. Um, maybe one more question, uh, Michael. I, I want to be a, a considerate of your time here. Uh, what do you think that, uh, why do you think flat earth proponents are unjustified for accepting the ancient Near East model that many Old Testament scholars defend as the background to the biblical texts? Okay, well, they don't because the ancient Near Eastern model was the sun goes through the underworld at night and flat earthers say the sun sort of goes around the flat earth like this at the top. So they don't actually accept the model. And we talked about this earlier in terms of speech act theory and the actual genre of the biblical text. It's not a scientific textbook. It's not trying to teach you ancient Near Eastern cosmology. It's just trying to use the language of the time to give theological truths, just like we could talk about the sunrise and the sunset without actually meaning we're describing cosmology. So go back, listen to the earlier part of the conversation. We cover that a lot more in depth. Yeah, I just want to confirm uh, Hislop is, is that H-I-S-L-O-P? Uh, Michael? H-I-S-L-O-P. Yeah, Alexander okay, Hislop. Okay. Alexander Hislop. So someone had asked. So Carol, uh, that's I put that into the into the comments in the chat box there, Alexander Hislop. Uh, the book is called The Two Babylons. The Two Babylons. Okay. So, um, yeah, avoid it like the plague. Yeah. Um, Michael, I think that's it in terms of questions. I I do want to thank you for uh, for joining us uh, tonight. A lot of uh, a lot of stuff to think about. Um, and, um, uh, well, someone's just popped something up. Do you want to just take this one last question, Michael? Is that okay? Bye. Have you looked at the da data that came I'll out? The various I'll bring, yeah, I'll bring it up. Sorry. It's just easier this way for you to read. Have you looked at the various evolutionary experience from the seventies and eighties that have been used for promulgating the idea that truth of DE uh, Darwinian okay. evolution, I would say. That's okay. Um, read books by like Stephen Jay Gould, uh, or, um, I'm not, or Simon Conway Morris. There's a great book here I have called Fitness of the Cosmos for Life. Uh, there's a lot of data that's come out since then. Uh, the, the arguments to defend evolution do not come from old stuff. We've moved well past this at this point. A lot of, there's a lot of new data that comes out every day. It's help, helping support the theory. I'm not a Darwinian evolutionist. I would call myself a structuralist. And that I believe that the universe is sort of fine-tuned, has fine-tuned or uh, laws of biology that force evolution to go in a certain direction. So if you were to rewind the tape of life and start over again, you would get human life again or something very similar because the laws of biology have been constrained or fine tuned to bring about certain structures. Uh, so I don't lean towards the functionalist side of evolution, I lean towards the structuralist side. And that's consistent with a theistic understanding of evolution because you could say God fine tuned the universe to create certain forms of life. And I have a video on my channel called Was Evolution Inevitable? where I go into this in detail and I use a lot of evidence that shows that maybe evolution was a lot more constrained than we think of. And I draw from things like Evo Devo research. Evo Devo is very new. Um, it's only a couple decades old. There's more research coming out to support that, um, as well as um, self-assembly processes, uh, new research coming out in abiogenesis. So this idea that it's all sort of from debunked experiments from the 70s and 80s, it's just a straw man. That's not the arguments and the evidence that evolutionary biologists are arguing from. Yeah. And this will be the last comment here. Semiramis was Nimrod's mother and husband. No, uh, we, just, <laughs> we just discussed that. Uh, no. Nimrod and Semiramis, a thousand years apart. Uh, and so it's kind of difficult for Semiramis to conceive Nimrod a thousand years before she was born. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so, Michael, thank you so much for giving of your time to be with us today. Um, yeah, I really, appreci really appreciate that. I hope you, we can have you back. And folks, uh,
just just because Michael and I don't agree on everything, uh, obviously we don't agree on 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 every single thing. Some of his views are different than mine. Um, we we still can have these discussions. Uh, so we we don't shut each other down. We listen to each other. We can debate things. We can question. We can comment. Um, but it's important that we listen. We listen. Listen to the information. Um, Michael, if there's any last words that you want to leave us with uh, on on the flat Earth, uh, what would that be? Your last famous words. Uh, my last famous words would be: Pray to God that He will lead you to truth and follow the evidence, and you will become unbiased, and you will not let your pride lead you, and your inability to admit you may be wrong. I've admitted that I've been wrong on things, and I've changed my views. Be willing to accept you might be wrong too, and try to follow the evidence. Listen to mainstream scientists. Don't just get all your stuff from conspiracy theorists you're going to find on BitChute. Uh, try to branch out and give the actual scientific community your ear and let them make their case. Please stop trying to stop coming to the table with endless skepticism that you think they're all in on it or something. Let them make their case. That Try to follow the evidence. That's all I say. Just try to be open-minded. I see a lot of conspiracy theorists that just aren't. Yeah. Yeah, and folks, uh, always remember something. Uh, the truth will set you free. The truth will prevail. Uh, and there's nothing to fear from the truth. Uh, the truth liberates us. And, um, you know, there's a lot of folks that I've met who have told me, you know, no, no amount of argumentation is going to convince me. It, basically, what that means is don't bother me with the facts. I've made up my mind already. And that's definitely not, the, that's definitely not where you want to go. You don't want to go there. You want to be open to truth. Uh, you know, even the ancient philosopher uh, Socrates said, follow the truth wherever it leads. Uh, and we know it leads ultimately to Christ. Christ is truth incarnate. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Uh, and, and you will know him. You will know him as truth. And, and, and that truth will set you free. All truth really is, at the end of the day, God's truth. And so uh, thank you again, um, uh, Michael. Uh, from Inspiring mm -hmm. Philosophy. Folks, check out his YouTube channel. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you for giving us your time. Thank you for your great questions. Um, keep on thinking. Keep on asking questions. God is not afraid of your questions. He's much bigger than you. And so uh, thanks, everybody. God bless you. Until next time, the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. May the Lord turn his face towards you, be gracious to you, and give you his shalom. God bless. Bye for now.